wow, there was a quiet hush that came over the crowd when I walked up here. I didn't think anybody was paying attention. That's pretty good. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd ask you this morning, look to your right. Everybody sitting up here, look to your right. Okay, look to your left. Stand up, sit down. No, I don't need to stand up, sit down. <laughs> if you don't recognize the person that you saw left or right of you, after the service, go introduce yourself this morning. And I would say the same thing to the folks at home uh, or wherever you might be online watching. Good morning to you, too. And if you're on your couch, look to your left, look to your right, <laughs> pet the dog, and then prepare yourself for worship. So please join me in worship as the uh, accolades light our candles this morning. Please stand for the call to worship. Yahweh, Lord, there are days when we are tired and weary. Lord, show us your light. Yahweh, Lord, there are days when we have just had enough. Lord, open our eyes to the healing of your word. <laughs> Yahweh, Lord, even though days are tough, you give us the strength to go on. Lord, there is no one like you. We worship your holy name. Father, we know that this world will give us endless suffering, but the Apostle John has told us that everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. This is our victory of faith in Christ. We pray that we can discern your truth and hold tight to your promises as we face the trials of this life. Help us to be faithful as we face, face the pressures of this world. We hold tight to your strength and promise through Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Glenn. It's always a good morning when we have some Stephen Curtis Chapman added into the mix. Uh, this morning, I want to invite you, as I usually do, to come to the altar if you're so inclined. We have had some, some uh, new folks and new faces coming, so I want to go back over and explain how we do our prayer time because it's a little different than a lot of churches do. Uh, I will pray a little bit, and then I'll come to a point where it's your turn. All we ask is that you be loud so everybody can hear. And that you finish with, Lord, in your mercy, and the church will respond, hear our prayer. For those online, let me give a little bit of different instructions. If you have a particular prayer you'd like to pray, pray it in the comments. And if you would, finish with, Lord, in your mercy, and then those who are joining with them, reply with, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Feel free to come to the altar rail and join me if you're so inclined. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. God, we give your name honor for the, the glory of another day. The glory of another day to see each other's faces. To breathe the air you provide. To feel the hope that you give. God, as we look at our world, there's a lot to give us reason for fear there's a lot for us to worry about. Thank you for being God and telling us directly and overtly to not fear and to not worry, but to pray instead. So as we come this morning, we acknowledge that there are things in our lives and things in our world that threaten to pull us away from you that threaten to pull us into worry and fear. Give us strength. Give us such a tight, deep connection to you that our human instinct changes to a divine one. Instead of instinctively worrying or being afraid, 
help us to instinctively pray. God, I lift to you today Lucy Nash and her family as this fourth grader prepares to likely see you face to face very soon. I ask for your comfort for her family and for all of the surrounding friends. Help them to know that you're God. Help them feel your presence and receive your grace, your healing, and your comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Glory to your name, Father. Glory to your name that you invite us not near you, not close to you, but right next to you inside the Holy of Holies. Thank you for providing a judgment seat that is also a mercy seat. Help us rely on your mercy and confidently live our lives under the shadow of your Holy Spirit. Help us share the truth that you love every soul infinitely, that your son Jesus made available their rescue from their own sinful nature. Help us to daily walk in that rescue and to offer it to as many faces and as many hearts as we encounter. God, give us the courage to submit to you, to surrender to you. And not just as a one-time thing, but as a, a daily, moment-by-moment, -moment, lifelong thing. We celebrate that surrender. We celebrate our submission as we pray the prayer of provision and submission that your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if the youngins will come, I'll try and get my high fives before I retreat. You got five for me, Ollie? Oh, you missed. You got five for me? I think I got them. All right. 
All right, how are you guys doing today? So earlier this week, I was writing a talk that I'm giving, and it was all about the church, and I had to figure out what's the church. So I want to show you some pictures, and I want you to tell me if this is the church or not. Go ahead. Is that the church? Yeah. How about this next one? Is that no. the church? No. That's actually a church I went to in Costa Rica. How about this? No. Is that the church? No. Nope. My brother's going to church right there, right now. He's worshiping there with no. Connection Point. How about the next one? Nope. I've seen a lot of people worshiping Jesus in this place. Mm -hmm. How about this next one? Is that a church? Yes. It is a church because that's actually a concert we went to and we worshiped Jesus for three hours in that concert with song and music. It was a wonderful place. So the question I have is, is the church a building? No. What is the church? Go ahead to the next one. The church is the people. We are the church. There was a song that I, growing up, that I, had, that I learned. It was, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. You guys want to sing that real quick? Uh, no. No? <laughs> Well, then, how about this? How about we just go, we'll, we'll pray then, okay? Hands out, hands together, eyes closed, head bowed. <laughs> Lord, please be with us as we depart today, showing the world that we are the church. It's not just a building. It is the people with inside that show the love and generosity and your well-being to all around. In your name we pray, amen. standing as we read God's word from 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 2 through 8. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Bathsheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Yahweh, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of Yahweh came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Please be seated. Thank you, Todd. There is one downfall to preaching from an iPad, and that is when it decides to do an update in the middle of worship. So if you'll pardon me just a minute, I'm going to bring up the sermon notes on my computer instead. Some of you may be familiar with the title of today's message, but you may not know where it comes from. You all are likely not even familiar with the title, and you have no idea where it comes from. 
So those of us who are over the age of 50 probably have at least heard it. Those of us over the age of 60 probably have some inkling of where it comes from. Those of us who are over 75 may have even seen it. It is a little bit before my time. Boy, it's taking forever to load, too. It is a little bit before my time, but in the 1930s, Walt Disney produced a short called The Three Little Pigs. Now, you know the story of The Three Little Pigs, right? Just making sure I'm not way out in left field. And as Walt Disney uh, uh, told the story of the three pigs, the two that were totally unprepared and the one that was prepared for life's turmoils, as they gathered in the third house, the one made of bricks that the, that the wolf couldn't blow down, they sang a song. Anybody remember the tune of the song? I'm looking over here. Oh, there's some younger folks over here that know it. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Tra la 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 la. Or as we used to sing when I was a kid, sure as heck not I. Sometimes you just got to add to the story a little bit. All right, we're not loading here either. I want to ask you can you relate with Elijah? Now, where we read was, was 1 Kings 19, but you really don't get 19 without looking at 18. So if you have your Bible open, or if you happen to, be, uh, to have your, your, your electronics open, pull up 1 Kings 18. And we're going to look a little bit at what might possibly be the motivation behind what Elijah does today. Oh, there we go. We finally have the notes. <laughs> so what goes on in 18? I hear mumbling. What happens in 1 Kings 18? Now, in 19, Elijah's obviously going through some turmoils. He's going through some internal struggles and some mental struggles that you and I probably never have had in our lives, have we? We've never experienced turmoils or struggles. We've never felt like the world is against us, right? I want you to look, though, at what has happened to Elijah right before this happens. Because I want you to see Elijah's humanity. See, it's easy for us, especially Old Testament characters, we do it with Jesus all the time because it's easy to do it with him. But we do it with Old Testament characters because they're so long ago that we think, I'm never going to be like that. That guy, I have nothing in common with him. Elijah, big name, woo! The Jews are supposedly waiting for Elijah because he's the predecessor to the to Messiah's coming. So they're looking for Elijah even today. Elijah, surely I have nothing in common with Elijah. I want you to see what happens. Elijah sends word to King Ahab. Now, Elijah's a dying breed. Why is he a dying breed? Because the prophets of Yahweh are dying in wide numbers very fast. Why are they dying? Because Ahab's wife, Jezebel, you probably heard that name, right? And not never in a good context. His wife, Jezebel, is killing or having killed the prophets of Yahweh, all of them. So one by one, they're dying. There's one guy who's hidden a hundred of them in his house. How do you hide a hundred people in your house? I don't know. Uh, maybe I can't relate with that guy, <laughs> but I can relate with Elijah. Elijah says, I, I need to make a, 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 an, a, I need to have an audience with the king. And the guy who's hiding these, these other prophets says, do you know how stupid that is? And Elijah says, I'm doing what I'm told to do. 
and he goes and he has a meeting with Ahab and he says, I'm tired of this swaying back and forth. You call the 450 prophets of Baal, a rival god, and you call the 400 prophets of Asherah, another rival god, and you have them meet for a showdown on Mount Carmel. Not that kind of showdown, but kind of that kind of showdown. So they meet on Mount Carmel, and here's just a little bit of what happens. Happens. They, he tells them, they, you prepare the, the feast. You prepare the sacrifice. So the prophets of Baal and Asherah build an altar out of rocks. Then they put wood on top of it. Then they slaughter a calf, and they put the calf on top of the wood. And he says, now don't light it, don't light it. What I want you to do is call on your God and see if he shows up. So you've got the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah both calling on their gods. And you know what happens? Nothing. And Elijah, I love when this, is, this stuff's in Scripture, Elijah taunts them. Nee, 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 nee. Listen to what he says. At noontime, he began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he's a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or relieving himself. Maybe your God's not answering because he's sitting on the pot. Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be awakened. So shout louder, shout louder, because you know it can't be that he's not a God. It can't be that, that he's not real. It can't be that he's a lesser and he's not showing up. <clears throat> but I want you to catch this too. At the time, at what, those who have your scriptures open, at what time does Elijah call God to respond? It's right at the beginning of one of the verses. There's a specific time stamp. The time of sacrifice. It's the ordinary time to produce a sacrifice for Yahweh. So Elijah waits all day until whatever that time is. It's probably sometime in the afternoon. It may be evening. It may be late at night. We don't know. But it's the regular time of sacrifice to Yahweh. And he says, okay, let's see what happens. I want you people of Israel to go fill four vats of water and dump them on the sacrifice. Now, a vat of water, we think of maybe a vat, but a vat held 50 gallons of water. So it's 200 gallons of water they pour on it. And Elijah goes, oh, wait a minute, let's do that again. So 400 gallons of water. And then he goes, uh, let's do it a third time just for, for good, for, for giggles. So 1,200 gallons of water are poured on the sacrifice, the wood, and it says that the water even ran around the altar and filled the trench that Elijah had them dig because God's going to show up and he's going to show up big. Back to where my notes are. So in verse 36 and 37, the usual time of offering for the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. Listen to what he prays. Listen to how humble this is. Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. Yahweh, answer me. Answer me. Notice he doesn't pray so that he'll be known as the best prophet or that he'll be known as, yeah, I'm the top dog, I'm the big daddy, I'm the whatever. Answer me so these people will know that you, Yahweh, are God and that you are bringing them back to yourself. Now, when this happens, I can't imagine the sound. 
The Bible doesn't record earth shaking or anything like that, but I can imagine a movie scene where there's a low rumble that gradually gets louder and louder and the ground shaking. And what we see is fire comes down from heaven. And in the, in the scriptures, it says, I'm sure I'm in the right spot. Immediately the fire of Yahweh flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. That's a big fire. How many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? At the end when they open, stupidly open the ark, and God shows up, and all of those things are streaming out of the Ark of the Covenant, imagine that coming down from heaven and just blasting on that, and, and it consumes everything. It dries up every drop of water in the trench. After 1,200 gallons of water, God shows up and consumes the offering the wood it was on, the rocks the wood was on, the water in the trench, and even the dust. It is in this context that Elijah prepares to run. Not yet. Because what happens next is Elijah gathers all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah and he kills every one of them. Now, I'm sure there were other people doing some of that slaughtering, but it was at his direction. And he tells them, don't let a single, it's right there in the scripture, by the way, don't let a single one of them escape. I want them all, and I want them all wiped out. What enemy is left? What enemy remains for Elijah to be frightened of? Jezebel. As the rainstorm comes up, Ahab goes home and tells Jezebel what he's seen. And that's how we get today's reading. Because when Jezebel hears that I, what Elijah has done and what his God has done, she sends this message to him. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I've not killed you just as you killed them. So Elijah, who has just won the World Series, the Super Bowl, and the World Cup all wrapped into one and probably everything else on top of that, he's just experienced the, the showing up of God of showing up of God. His first reaction when Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you just like you killed them, is to run. I'd like to call him a DA, but I don't want you to think that means district attorney. What an idiot. How many times have we in our lives experienced God and the minute a threat comes, we're just like Elijah? We're just like him. We think we have nothing in common with this prophet because he did such great things. But the truth is, we could do those great things too. We choose not to because we're busy running. I want to look a little bit at that running. There are three characteristics, three elements of Elijah's running. After confronting the king, after confronting the prophets of Baal and Asherah, after confidently making fun of them to their face, after his God showing up, after slaughtering all the rival prophets, Isaiah turns tail, or Elijah turns tail and runs away. The moment Jezebel sends a threat. Elijah gains zero confidence from this experience. Can God use flawed human beings? Let me make that a non-rhetorical. Can God use a flawed human being to accomplish his purposes? 
you, you don't sound real confident of that. Can our God, Yahweh, the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, can our God use an average ordinary human being who's flawed as all get out to accomplish his purpose? Yes, he can. Can God use you? See, we have a lot more in common with Elijah than we think. Because we have those ups and downs in our lives too, don't we? Don't we? Yeah, we do. We have the highest of highs followed by the lowest of lows. And when the highest of highs hit, it's really tempting to say, God loves me, he's so great. And then when we go to the valley, we think God has abandoned us. But the reality is, we've probably abandoned him. Ooh, that one hurts, doesn't it? We're not terribly different from Elijah. The first movement that we see is his running. Elijah shows us his brokenness immediately after God has shown up. Immediately after God has affirmed him as his prophet and being his ambassador, his emissary. So let me say, if Elijah can, can run immediately after that, whatever you've done that you feel bad about, don't beat yourself up about it. It's not likely as stupid as what Elijah did. And Elijah's one of the ones we hang our hat on. He's one of the ones we rely on. And we say, if Elijah can do this, oh yeah, we can keep going. But if Elijah can do this, you can do this too. Don't let yourself beat yourself up and keep you from responding to God's call in your life. What Elijah forgot, we often forget. God's call on your life has nothing to do with you. Nothing. God's call on your life has everything to do with Him. And if He's called you to it, He can equip you for it. And He will drive you to it. Even in Elijah's running away, he runs into the wilderness. The scripture says he traveled all day into the wilderness. It's one day, one day from this moment of great experience, this great success, this great victory. One day he finds himself hanging out under a broom tree. And what does he pray for? Oh, Lord, let me die. I'm so done with this life. Just take it away from me. Nothing's wrong with this guy that isn't wrong with every one of us. He is no different from you and me. When the chips are down, our first response is often to throw in the towel and run the other way. But Elijah, after he prays this prayer, he falls asleep and an angel of Yahweh wakes him up and he says, Eat, because you're going to need the strength. And then Elijah falls asleep again and he wakes him up again and he says, Eat some more because you're going to need this strength. Now the third movement in is, is an encounter with God that he gets. We're not going to get there today. It's an amazing encounter. I encourage you to read it later in the afternoon. But I want to sit in this second movement for a little bit today. What happens after he wakes up and eats? Those of you who have the scripture open, what happens? Say it louder. He goes back to sleep, but they wake him up again and says, okay, now, now eat again. And then what happens? He travels. How long? Who said that? 40 days and 40 nights. Now let's see if this sounds very familiar to you. He eats a bunch of food at first because when he goes on this 40 day and 40 night experience, he's fasting in the wilderness. For 40 days and four, does that sound familiar to us? Who else goes through that experience in the scriptures? Jesus, thank you for the Sunday school answer and tone. Right before what happens? Do you remember what Jesus is going through the wilderness before? It's right after 
He's baptized, and then he goes into the wilderness for 40 days at the beginning of his three-year ministry. Right before all of this magnificence happens, he spends 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, in the wilderness, fasting. And that's what Elijah does. So that's why I say the third movement is when God shows up for him in a cave. Uh, I encourage you to read that. It's really a cool experience, really a cool uh, a description. So let me ask you, when he's heading there, where, where is he heading? The mountain of God, what other translations do you have? Some of you might have Mount Horeb, but there's another name for it that we're more familiar with. What is it? Mount Sinai. What is that mountain? Nice and loud. I heard somebody say it over here. That's where Moses got the Ten Commandments. That's where they encamped when they were, when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Years. Forty is a really important number, apparently. And while they're encamped, Moses would go up Mount Sinai. God would show up and he would come down. And by experiencing God, his face glowed so much that people were afraid of him. He had to wear a veil when he came down off the mountain. And Elijah, when he's scared, he runs to where he knows God shows up. When I'm scared, I run somewhere where I know I'm in control. Which one is right? When I'm scared, I grasp for something that I can control so that I'm in charge again. Because I know everything will be fine when I'm in charge. And I think Elijah's stupid. Elijah, when the chips are down, runs to where he knows God will speak to him and show up. So what do we have where God will definitely show up? Where can we run to? Bob gave us an impassioned plea last week I was supposed to grab one of those and I didn't so but you can see it up there I want to add to his impassioned plea the global Methodist Church is a fledgling denomination that really barely exists at this point we've had a really good start But the foundation we have right now is all transitional. It's all interim. And in September, we will be making it permanent. How important do you think having a good foundation at the beginning is? Oh, man. It's really, really important. Now, I know a lot of you took those books last week. Thank you. For those who didn't, maybe you thought, eh, that's not really for me. I printed 20 more. There were already five laying out, so there's 25 more. If you don't like the paper versions, that's okay. You can scan that QR code, and it'll take you to the electronic version. But I want to add to Bob's impassioned plea for you to do this. I want to add to it a pastoral call to do it. I want to call the entire church to 35 days of prayer and fasting. It's already started, but this is day five. So 35 days of prayer and fasting. Now, fasting is not something we ordinarily do in our culture. In our society, we have dropped it like a hot, hot potato. We don't like it because it makes us feel bad because I get hungry and I don't like being hungry, right? The rest of the world, they can all be hungry, but we don't want to be hungry. But hunger does something for us. Let me get practical about fasting. When you're hungry, what happens to you physically? What do you feel? Tired? 
Now, the, the medical term wouldn't be pain, but pang. We call them hunger pangs, although we usually say hunger pains, right? Your belly rumbles, doesn't it? I mean, that's a, simple, a kid can answer that one. When I'm hungry, my belly rumbles. And we've all felt that a time or two, and our first instinct is to eat. When we're fasting, that physical symptom is a signal that it's time to pray. This 40 days can be just like the 40 days of Lent when we give something up. Now, practically, I'm not asking you to give up food and water for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm not crazy and I don't need the lawsuits. But maybe, maybe you give up one meal a day that is what you think is the most important meal and your belly's going to rumble the most from it. Maybe you take 24 hours during a week and you give up food for that 24 hours so that your belly will rumble and you'll have that. Maybe food is not your thing. Maybe you're diabetic and you can't do fasting. Maybe something else is going to be harder for you anyway. Maybe you give something up that you'll really miss for the entire 40 days. I'll tell you one of the most unusual fasts I ever did for Lent one year, and it was so effective, I've, I've done it several years, I can't do it anymore. You'll understand why in a minute. I am a noise junkie. You can ask Annette, she likes to sleep in silence, I like to sleep with noise. TV, radio, music, something. I like to have noise. When I'm reading, and when I'm reading all of these resolutions and petitions and things for Jim, I have music on. I have to have something on in the background because I am a noise junkie. For Lent one year, I decided to take away any noise when I was driving. So when I got in the truck, I couldn't use the radio. I couldn't put on my MP3s. I couldn't stream music. I couldn't do anything that had noise. It was just me and my thoughts. And every time I got in the truck, I immediately reached for the volume knob. So much so, I had to put a note on the volume knob, time to pray. I prayed more that Lent than any other Lent. Because every time I got in the truck, the silence was overwhelming and I reached. I can't do that now because I live across the parking lot. I don't drive to work anymore. Just not as effective. Find what will be effective for you. Find where you have an instinctive reaction to correct whatever you think is wrong and give that up for 40 days. And when you feel that instinct to reach for the volume knob, it's time to pray. It's time to pray not only for the, for the, for the GMC's general conference. We need that. We absolutely need it. And that's the impetus for this particular and all of the prayer prompts are, are based on that. But let me say there are people in this sanctuary, there are people watching online who are having a tough time right now. I don't know what those are. I don't know who they are. But prayer and fasting is a historic teaching of the church that helps you get from tough time to more settled time, from uh, uh, uncertain time to certainty in God. Because it's not about you, it's about God's presence in your life. That's what brings peace, it's what brings hope, it what br it's what brings the desire for the future instead of a desire to sit under a broom tree and die. Are you having a tough time? Because if you are, the last thing you would think would be to pray and fast. But the last thing you think of is often the first thing you need. So for the next 35 days, as the pastor of this church, I call the church to prayer and fasting. Primarily for the general conference, that we would do God's will, that we would have a godly founding that would last the rest of our lives and into our kids, 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 kids' lives of faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But on top of that, use this as an opportunity to be sensitive and pray for those needs you know around you 
And maybe the need you know around you is right inside yourself. There are more of those books available. If you prefer the paper and we're out of them, let me know. I'll print as many as we need to. You can get the electronic. You can get the print. But the activity, the discipline of fasting will improve your prayer time. And it will change your habit. It will remind you that you don't need whatever it is you've given up. What you need is Him. And you need Him active. And you need Him working on your behalf. So for 35 days, I call us to prayer and fasting. And I'd like to begin that by asking you to stand And we're going to pray the beginning of Psalm 130 together in unison. If you'd stand, let's pray together. From the depths of despair, Yahweh, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Yahweh, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on Yahweh. Yes, I am counting on you. I have put my hope in your word. I long for you, Lord, more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer and let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. God and let the people say Amen. amen please be seated as Todd comes and gives us some opportunities to serve today's opportunities for service and fellowship the women in ministry will hold a bridal shower for Sam Orbaugh and Emily Chesham we're sitting right over here in the corner <laughs> at Bartlett uh, here today at 2 p.m. this afternoon uh, everyone is invited and the couples registered at Walmart and Amazon Tonight there's a meeting for parents of kids in rooted youth at 5 o'clock. Following the meetings, the kids will have youth group from 6 to 8. 
Seniors on the Go is Tuesday at noon. The program is Adeline's Adventures in Australia with Adeline Colstow. Uh, please sign up in the hallway uh, so they can know how many people to expect for lunch. Uh, the Barnabas Ministry will soon be in full swing for the new school year. So if you are a college student, please pick up information uh, at the Welcome Center on the Barnabas Ministry. And the next church softball game is tomorrow night here at Bartlett. <laughs> this is funny. Come out and root, root, root for the home team. If we don't win, it's a shame. Come on, everybody. One, two, three strikes. You're out at the old ball game. I'm done. No. <laughs> Looking ahead, uh, the annual Bartlett Women in Ministry Holiday Craft Bazaar is scheduled for Saturday, October 26th. If you have crafts or artworks to sell, or you'd like a booth, please contact the office or contact Susie Thibodeau for more info and or a registration form. Flyers are on the table in the hallway if you'd like more information. As always, there are signups for greeters, valet parking, welcome desk, and refreshments. Check the kiosk in the hall for those opportunities. And I believe Annette is gonna come up here and give us some more information on the ladies' retreat. Good morning. We Good morning. started in March reminding you to save the date, and it's very close now. September 14th is our women's retreat, and again, that is for all ladies, high school and older. Um, and our deadline to sign up for it will be September 1st, so we need you to get those in, so we are all ready. In fact, we have a leadership meeting today of those that are going to help um, lead and speak at the retreat. I'm really excited. It's, it's not a fancy retreat. It's not one where we have this real um, foo-foo speaker that's gonna lead us in some uh, Bible study. Not that that's a, a bad thing, but this is going to be ladies that many of you know that are just gonna help you take a few moments to spend time around a table together and thinking about God looking at a few scriptures and applying that to our lives. It's a very casual, relaxing time together so that you can just focus on your time with God and get to know some other ladies um, in an unrushed atmosphere. We will take care of your food needs and we'll relax and just enjoy our time together. So please um, invite a friend to come. This is a great, ideal opportunity to bring a friend with you. Um, and you can uh, register out in the lobby or online. Uh, go to the church website, and there's a button right there to click and sign up. If you have any other questions, please see me. Uh, I'm Annette Gadlich. And uh, otherwise, the leadership team is going to be meeting today at 1 o'clock. Uh, so we will see them then. Thank you. And I'll give you one more opportunity to have fellowship with one another. Uh, if you leave out today, out these doors, and you turn left, and keep going, keep going, keep going, eventually, you're going to run into some people with donuts and coffee. Who doesn't like donuts? Who doesn't like coffee? Well, some people don't like coffee. Who doesn't like donuts? We'd love to see you down there and spend a little bit of time together. As you pray and as you fast, and as you go and share God's love with, the, with his people, may that same God bless you and keep you. Turn and show his face to you, so much so that you glow like Moses, and people don't know how to react. Yahweh pour out his grace and his peace on you, and be face to face as you go and share him with others. Amen. God bless you.